Hello, everyone. My name is Craig Johnson, and I'm director of the Guelph Institute of Development Studies here at the University of Guelph. It's an honor and privilege to be here with you tonight and to welcome you to the annual Hopper Lecture in International Development. By my count, this is the 24th Hopper Lecture that we've had here on campus since 1993, and it's the first that we've had in person since our world was turned upside down in March 2020. I think we're all happy, happy to be together once again. I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Caroline Shinaz Hossein, uh, and in a minute, our president and vice chancellor, Dr. Charlotte Yates, will be introducing her formally. Before handing over, I'd first like to acknowledge the support of Canada's International Development Research Centre, IDRC, whose endowment has supported the annual Hopper Lecture here at the university since 1993. I'd also like to give a special word of thanks to Lisa Blakensop, Steffi Hamann, Abir L. Arcusosi, and especially Faith Van Hesch for making this very special event a reality. As you know, tonight's lecture is being live streamed on Teams. And at the end of Dr. Hossein's talk, we'll be moderating a Q&A session with audience members who are here in the auditorium. So no pressure. Um, now I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our president and vice chancellor, Dr. Charlotte Yates. Dr. Yates is the ninth president and vice chancellor of the University of Guelph, having first joined U of G in 2015 as the university's provost and vice president academic. Dr. Yates is also a faculty member in the Department of Political Science where her research takes an interdisciplinary industry and community engaged approach to the Canadian automotive sector, labor markets and employment, as well as women, work and family. She's the author of three books, having published dozens of peer reviewed articles and reports and supervised more than 40 graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. Dr. Yates also serves on the board of YWCA Canada. She's a director of the Automotive Policy Research Center and a federal government appointee on the Canadian Automotive Partnership Council. Under her leadership as provost and now as president, Dr. Yates has fostered a deep commitment to indigenization, equity, diversity, and inclusion, including the University of Guelph's Indigenous Initiative Strategy and its Anti-Racism Action Plan. I hope you'll join me now in welcoming Dr. Charlotte Yates to the podium. Good evening, everybody, and uh, it's so nice to see you all in person, notwithstanding the fact that some of you I may not recognize because you have masks on, but nonetheless, it is wonderful to welcome you and in this beautiful new uh, learning space. So, uh, and thank you, Craig, for that lovely introduction. Uh, I am so delighted that I could join you and that we're able to offer a hybrid event. Uh, we are live streaming plus, of course, those of us who've been able to attend tonight. And as we begin this evening, and as we're back in a place and space, I think it's incredibly important that as we think about our personal and virtual relationship to the land, I'd like us to take a, a moment to reflect on that relationship to our land. And the lands on which in particular, the University of Guelph resides and in which we connect as a university and as a community. Guelph resides within the lands of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum and on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We also recognize the many diverse communities of First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples who call these lands home today. And if any of you come from different communities when you come to Guelph, you will know that each and every community has their own distinct land acknowledgement in recognition of that incredible diversity and of the landed rights of those different communities. Through this land acknowledgement and our actions here tonight, day to day, week to week, we reaffirm University of Guelph's commitment to ensuring that indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing, sorry, are meaningfully and respectfully woven into the framework of our institution within the goals of reconciliation, decolonization, anti-racism and an equitable future for all. 
So whether you were joining us here today in person or remotely, welcome to the University of Guelph. And I apologize for keeping my mask on, but we're still at a point, but I have, uh, I'm only speaking for a short time. I believe uh, Dr. Hossein is asked, she's in a socially distanced environment where she would be able to uh, speak without a mask, given that uh, it's hard to speak for long periods of time. Um, so I want to acknowledge, first of all, our Guelph MP, Lloyd Longfield, who is joining us virtually this evening. I also want to welcome our Dean of the Ontario Veterinary College, Jeff Witchell, uh, who is here tonight, as well as a number of faculty, staff, and of course, students, uh, some of whom I know and some of whom I hope I get to know uh, tonight and in the weeks and months ahead. At last, I really want to give a very special welcome to Dr. Carolyn Shanaz Hossein. Dr. Hossein, we look forward to hearing from you this evening. As um, Craig has uh, introduced to us, the Hopper Lecture Series is made possible through the generous sponsorship of the International Development Research Centre in honour of its first president, David Hopper. The lecture is coordinated by the Guelph Institute of Development Studies, which is, I will say, a recognised hub of intellectual and I think activity, academic excellence, and with a real focus on students and also uh, engaging with the globe and being uh, engaged with and having the globe engage uh, with the Institute. Since its launch, and I'm grateful, of course, to Professor Greg Johnson, who is the director of the Institute, and for their entire team for the thoughtful planning for this evening's event. Since its launch in 1993, the Hopper Lecture has become a staple uh, annual event for the University of Guelph. And in some ways, when you reflect, that's a long time to hold a lecture every year. And as you can imagine, it's changed and evolved over that time. This year, Dr. Hossein will explore the future of cooperation, acknowledging black feminist economies in the global south and beyond. In discussing the tradition and expertise of banker ladies in the African diaspora, and I just love, I can't wait to unpack that concept. Uh, Dr. Hossein will explain how we can build a more inclusive economy and radically transform Canadian international development policy. Your topic is so timely for us tonight, especially as we have very clear evidence that the additional health, economic and social inequities that have been created by the COVID-19 pandemic. Inclusive and sustainable growth are central to our collective well-being, whether here in Guelph, in Canada, or abroad and around the world. These are pressing issues that the University of Guelph uh, grapples, to, grapples with, and we're so honored to have a guest contribute to those discussions and understandings. Researchers from the Guelph Institute of Development Studies are exploring just these kinds of issues. And I want to make a special mention of, under the leadership of Dr. Andrea uh, Peraz, they published a report last fall on the impact of the pandemic on the national foreign aid sector, showing that 60% of NGOs reported a decline in funding since March 2020. And we know how critical those NGOs are for the support of healthy uh, communities. And despite the focus on gender equality and Canada's feminist international assistance policy, less than one fifth of organizations surveyed reported implementation of a gender-based approach in their pandemic response. Furthermore, the report's findings showed significant and negative long-term consequences if funding was diverted uh, to COVID-19 response without consideration to other existing and ongoing global issues. I want to say, and I won't go into great detail, but there are a couple of uh, developments at the University of Guelph, which I want to highlight, which I suppose works so well with the topic of your discussion tonight. The university has been deeply engaged in a discussion around indigenization, as well as advancing equity, diversity and inclusion on our campus. Uh, we developed under our Office of Diversity and Human Rights an equity, diversity and inclusion handbook for individuals and organizations during COVID-19, which ended up being shared by many universities across Canada as they wrestled with how to address those inequities arising from COVID-19. I'm also excited to share that on November 18th, the University of Guelph will be signing the Scarborough Charter on anti-Black racism and Black inclusion in Canadian higher education. 
Universities have come together to sign this charter, which makes commitments uh, around data collection, community engagement, accountability, and curriculum changes in order to combat anti-Black racism. All of these plans, along with our Indigenous uh, uh, Initiative Strategy, which was adopted by our Board of Governors, are ways of advancing uh, our commitment to uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, reconciliation, anti-racism, and decolonization of our institution. And so the timing of this lecture, the content of this lecture is so incredibly timing. These are subjects which we are deeply interested in. I want to know more. I'm sure all of us here tonight will learn so much from our guest speaker, to whom now let me turn my attention. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Carolyn Shanaz Hussain, who is an Associate Professor of Global Development and Political Science at the University of Toronto Scarborough. She is the founder of Diverse Solidarity Economies Collective, which pushes for equitable uh, economies. She holds a coveted Honor Ontario Early Research Award and her project African Origins in the Social Economy has been funded by the SSHRC. In 2021, she delivered the Big Thinking Lecture for the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences entitled Canada's Hidden Cooperative System. Dr. Hussain is an elected board member to the International Association of Feminist Economics, academic advisor at Oxford University Press, and an editorial board member to the UN Task Force for the Social and Solidarity Economy. She is the author of the multi-award-winning Politicized Microfinance, co-author to Critical Introduction to Business and Society, and editor of The Black Social Economy, as well as numerous book chapters and articles. Her co-edited book, Community Economies in the Global South, by Oxford University Press will be out next year. Welcome, Dr. Hossein. We are very, very honored to have you with us, and we look forward to an exciting and insightful lecture. Thank you. I'd like to thank the University of Guelph for inviting me to deliver the 2021 Hopper Lecture, named after the International Development Research Center's IDRC's first president, David Hopper. President Charlotte Yates, thank you for the most generous introduction and warm welcome. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you at, at Guelph University. To Professor Craig Johnson, his really able and amazing um, staff members and colleagues at the Institute of Development Studies. I thank you for all of the support in getting us here today after years of not being able to deliver the Hopper Lecture. And to the IDRC, thank you for all the funding you make possible to do these kinds of events. Before I, usually, before I start any public event, I like to also say a country acknowledgement, to say that I'm grateful to live, work and play on unceded Indigenous lands. And as a Black feminist scholar, I want to find ways to build alliances between Black and Indigenous people, especially women cooperators. My name is Caroline Shanaz Hossein, and I'm a professor of global development and political science at the University of Toronto, Scarborough. The title of my talk is The Future of Cooperation, Acknowledging Black Feminist Economies in the Global South and Beyond. I have spent more than a decade working on alternative development. My work is funded by the SHRC Insight Development Grant, and I hold the Early Researcher Award from the province of Ontario. Both of these grants make the work that I do on economic cooperation possible in what I'll share with you here today. I'm also the founder, as uh, President uh, Yates just mentioned, of the Diverse Solidarity Economies Collective, we call it DICE for short. I urge you to visit my website to see the group of feminist scholars 
in Canada and beyond who are working on ways to decolonize economics. Since 2006, I've been studying and writing on development, financial exclusion, and cooperative economics, specifically for the African diaspora, and how to make business and society inclusive. But before becoming an academic, I worked as a practitioner in international development. I was most influenced by, my, by an international NGO out of North Philadelphia called OIC International. This NGO was led by African-Americans and founded by the late Reverend Leon Sullivan, a civil rights activist. So there you have it. I was this Canadian managing global development programs for OIC. And what I learned from African-Americans was how to do business equitably, how to co-opt aid and be mindful of the biased allocations that occur in the ways that monies are distributed. This teaching on black solidarity economies resonated with me because I bear witness to the indignities that my own family has suffered when my parents emigrated 50 years ago to Toronto via New York City from the Caribbean. Growing up in the GTA, we crisscrossed in a number of Caribbean and ethnic communities, places around downtown core to Malvern in the east, up back to York region, Downsview in the west end of the city. And just before I graduated high school, my parents found a footing in Vaughan, just north of the city of Toronto. My story is a common one for many black Canadians and newcomers where precarity is the norm. But the solidarity economy and counting on those you know and trust was also my norm. When we think about cooperation and its future, we seldom think of it in the informal economy. But co-ops, cooperatives in the most democratic form are occurring out of the public eye. How many of you have heard of Ajo, Osusu, Sanduk, Patna, Chit, or Erisan? These cultural names, which also include Tantines pour les Beninois, or Chitu for Sri Lankans. In the academy, we refer to this global phenomenon as rotating savings and credit associations, ROSCAs for short. And this is what I'll speak about today. ROSCAs are hidden forms of cooperatives and many Global South people use them as a form of economic cooperation. And this has particular importance to Canada and the way we do development here, both at home and overseas. I confess, that Roskas are not new to me. My great grandmother, Maud Gittins, was a Grenadian caterer who lived in Sandy Grandy, Trinidad. But she was also a well known banker lady of a Susu. Susu is a local name for a Roska, and the name originates in Ghana, West Africa. And Susu can be found among the African diaspora in many places. These Roscas are at the very core of the international and solidarity economy. Susus and the many names they are called are embedded in civil society. I've been teaching and writing on Roscas for about a decade. They are well-managed voluntary co-ops practiced around the world. Roscas are usually described in the local vernacular, as I just mentioned, Somali Ayutu, Jamaican Patna, Indian Chit, Guyanese Boxhand, Haitian Sol, Chinese Hua. Then there are Itiga in Kenya, Rounds in Zimbabwe, Restourn for the Congolese, Ekub for Eritreans and Ethiopians, and Tandas for the people of Latin America. And the list goes on. When people come here to Canada to live, they bring these systems and organize Roscas from around the world. Roscas are a Southern invention. The women who manage these co-ops call themselves the banker ladies. Banker ladies and the Roscas they organize adhere to the same principles as other cooperatives, but they are also concerned about social support and kindness, wanting to give people a place to belong. It was while doing my doctoral research in 2007 that I realized that it was Roscas making a difference in people's economic and social lives. At that time, I was researching a type of development finance that some of you may know of, microfinance, in three Caribbean countries. 
Later, I interviewed close to 600 people for my book, Politicized Microfinance, and found that professionalized, commercialized financial systems concerned about poverty were limited in what they could do. Cooperative banks were the ones closing the gaps on inequities. This is especially true of Roscas. Roscas are an example of real life cooperation occurring because of stressors and marginalized women are the ones standing up to the commercial order to organize the economy in a way that we can all participate. These Roscas are informal groups managed by people who often share the same socioeconomic class and who are alienated from goods and services. Roska members decide how their co-op will be structured, how they will function. The group decides on the structure based on consensus usually, but they also have the vote in, in, in times of debate or difference. In the groups, members contribute to what they call a hand. A hand is a, is a fixed sum of money that is contributed on a specific cycle, which could be a weekly or monthly basis, to a pool. And that lump sum of money from the pool is collected, then shared with a member. My work on solidarity economies is correcting the erasure of the contributions of, of people of African descent in the cooperative sector. I teach my students about cooper cooperatives, nonprofits, and social enterprises and mutual aid so that they can go into the world and make business inclusive. I'm proud to say that I see many of them disrupting conventional business practice here in Canada and internationally. Most of the students I teach are Canadian, as well as international students who represent dozens of countries in the global south. They do not see development as this one way dialogue and they want us to acknowledge that other forms of cooperation exist. They see that our development agenda is long overdue for a redesign that is mindful of non-Western expertise in how we do local economic development. My research is smashing up the binaries of no South and North, of capitalism versus socialism, of left versus right. It pushes us all to think about feminist futures and the theory of community economy. Feminist scholars, the late Julie Graham and Catherine Gibson, known as JK Gibson Graham, and CERN, the Community Economies Research Network, reject this fixation on the capitalist firm as a unit of analysis for how to conduct business. They liken the Western bias to an iceberg before you, where the capitalist firm is the very small visible part of the iceberg we actually see. And most of life's interactions in the market are the submerged part, hidden away. Community economies have always been around. So much of our self-provisioning on this planet is beneath the surface. What is important here is that these diverse community economies can politicize cooperation in a way that we can undo exclusions existing in our world. The black political economy has an endless supply of knowledge making for cooperation. It should be re read and reread this way because of its insistence of addressing issues of racial capitalism, sexism, and other forms of discrimination and identity bias. As a black feminist scholar, I am steeped in the idea of community economies, cooperatives, and solidarity economies, along with intersectionality. Development cannot be the stages linear project that assumes that all groups can interact with the state and private sector. Many people of African descent are becoming are being harmed and as a result, they self exclude. If the COVID-19 pandemic has taught any of us anything, it should be that the future of cooperation requires that aid needs a new design, one that is thoughtful, more efficient and mindful of the knowledge and expertise beyond the white expert. We should be listening to black feminist scholars who do the empirical work, usually of communities they know very well, and they are guided by the appropriate theory. This is why my theory on the black social economy is useful, 
It draws on black feminist concepts of lived experience, intersectionality, to see the interlocking oppressions occurring in our economic and social lives. Legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw coined the concept of intersectionality. She made it clear to all of us way back in 1989 that the laws were ignorant of a double bind of being both black and female. To counter those inequities, historically oppressed people of African descent must politicize networks, usually hidden ones, below the surface in these ways to combat exclusion. To animate the black social economy, the banker ladies are living proof that there is what Karl Polanyi in his book called The Great Transformation referred to as the double movement. The banker ladies are the double movement of today, offering a real alternative to pure capitalist business system. There is a quiet resistance taking place by the banker ladies. Black feminist thought is the way we will arrive at knowing what the black social economy is. It is the way to consider the thousands of black and racialized women who lead co-ops in this country and who are remaking economies in spite of the traumas they endure every day. They can, gui they can be guiding Canada on how to do financial development, both here at home and globally. Yet, the scholarship on the social economy does not view black women as a chief architect. Marginalized women, especially black women, are usually studied down in political economy. We, are, we usually analyze them as being on the receiving end of the aid. The black social economy pushes back against this very one dimensional view. Economist and professor Nina Banks at Bucknell University argues that it's time to value, meaning that we pay for it, the community work and activism of, black, of African Americans and Hispanic women in the economy. There's a very good write up in the New York Times on this. My work largely builds on the research of social justice professor Jessica Gordon Nemhard at the City University of New York, CUNY. And she reminds us that African American innovation and cooperatives of, of the innovation in African American cooperatives and that black people had to hide their cooperation because it was often dangerous to go public. Pan-Africanist leader Marcus Garvey created the world's largest member-owned institution, the UNIA, to promote humanity. We know all about his work from professors like Rupert Lewis, Keisha Blaine, Tony Martin, and Garvey's wife, Amy Jacques Garvey, and so, so many others. What is clear is that there's so much black and feminist political economy theory that shows us that some forms of cooperation are purposefully hidden and politicized with good reason. We should be reading and citing black feminist political economy as we do policy reports or as we make these presentations to the sector. The hundreds of black women from the Caribbean and Canada I interviewed over the years and you can see them here in this table, show that they make space in our economies through cooperatives for alienated citizens who ask for nothing in return. I spent more than three years um, in the financial centers of Toronto and Montreal, interviewing banker ladies from Rexdale Scarborough in the GTA to Little Burgundy and Papineau in Montreal. These women actually represent more women because each banker lady represents the members of their group. So if you look at the number that I actually interviewed, multiply that by a factor of anywhere between 10 or 80 members because that's how large Roscas can be. Actually, in Haiti, the soul would have more than 100 members per group. In Toronto, I met a Cameroon, Jangji, who had more than a thousand members spread across the country. It should be remembered that these banker ladies who organize co-ops refuse to idly sit by waiting on handouts. They contribute as cooperators to make the world a better place. The banker ladies hold the keys to underdevelopment. This is in part because they are consciously redefining what they do. They use group consensus and mutual aid 
to help those discriminated against or feel like they don't belong anywhere and make them belong somewhere. The work they do fosters positive forms of social capital. The Canadian case, though, diverges from the 300 plus Caribbean banker ladies I already interviewed. Those Caribbean women, as well as the women in Ghana and Ethiopia I interviewed, who use SUSU and ECU systems respectively, are living in societies where citizens of those countries recognize and appreciate their banker ladies. The divergence or complication that I'm speaking about is not in the mechanics of how ROSCAs operate. ROSCAs will vary depending on every group dynamic, but the complication and the divergence here is in the lack of acknowledging these systems in Canada. We see a spate of Black, Indigenous, and Muslim Canadians discriminated against when they go into formal banks to carry out very mundane transactions. To respond, Canada's banker ladies are the cooperators who reach these affected people, but their work is ignored. Canadian Roscas remain hidden. Whereas Caribbean banker ladies, from my 300 plus interviews, made it abundantly clear to me that they are valued for the contributions they make. Elite bankers in Jamaica will roll out the partner plan, which is a ROSCA, to mimic these local innovations. Haitian bankers in the very prestigious Bank Sojusol have created a Mama Sol product line because they understand people's affinities to African indigenous forms of banking. However, this is not happening in Canada. The bank ladies are not being valued for their cooperation. We can see that cooperation from the grassroots is what is sustainable in complex environments. From my empirical research, I have learned that there is a logic to cooperation, especially of the informal variety, because it is box hand and susu and such banks like that, that protect people from various forms of bias and local conflict. For this reason, it is no surprise that these informal banks that I'm speaking about are the preferred banks for most Caribbean people that I interviewed. This finding actually aligns with extensive research in a book called Portfolios of the Poor, where they examined hundreds of financial diaries in Bangladesh, India, Kenya, and South Africa, and they found that banking co-ops called CHIT, Itiga, Stock Vells, are the number one device used by excluded people who are left out of mainstream systems. The idea that we call on experts to fix access to finance is problematic. For too, for too many development, too, sorry, too many development finance programs only copy what is already happening on the ground. It is these grassroots money-making collectives that are making the difference. The banker ladies show that it takes local women who are capable in ma making the time to create viable, viable alternatives so that excluded groups do not have to be beholden to any kind of elite politics. Caribbean cooperators, and I'll let you have some, a moment to read that quote. Caribbean bank cooperators like Mummy in Grenada, who is a spice seller, makes a valid point in her quote that we bind. Susu members in Grenada are building their own banking co-op. And this activity is rooted in truth and reciprocity. By coming together with these do it together financial systems, the banker ladies make a difference by helping women to meet their livelihood needs. This is local innovation from the ground up. And this work of community finance is seen in the Caribbean region. The banker ladies know their local context and they can comment and share goods as a way to push against the rhetoric of scarcity. But the banker ladies are also problem solvers on top of making finance accessible. When there are issues of anti-Black racism taking place in Trinidad or Guyana, 
Susu and Box Hand is there. When elite capture takes hold and the big bosses or informal actors like gangs or dons or even formal actors like CD politicians want to carry out patronage politics, partner, it's Araska, is there to give Jamaicans the choice to opt out of that kind of corrupt politics. The labor of Roska building is seen and respected in the Caribbean. A point worth noting is that the banker ladies, whether they are in the Caribbean or in Canada, remain unremunerated for their work as good citizens. They are not being paid for the work of building a vibrant civil society. My research shows that the Canadian case has a further divergence that is beyond not only being recognized or seen. The banker ladies of Canada are being vilified. They are stigmatized. They are called terrorists, gamblers, drug dealers, money launderers, pyramid schemers, engaged in illicit activity. Sudanese Canadians, Muslim Canadian women tell me time and time again that they are being accused of funding terrorist groups like Al-Shabaab. Many Canadian banker ladies fear the government and police. Police confiscate their goods when they raid their apartment blocks. No authority will listen to their explanations that the money is used for Roska, a mutual aid group that contributes to local development and that is a legal form of financial cooperation. So it's no wonder that these women leading Roskas feel that what they're doing is a form of resistance. This is why we made the film the banker ladies, because the banker ladies want to change mindsets about what they do and they will no longer and they no longer want it to feel as though what they do is illegal or wrong. They are tired of hiding. They will show you in their own voices in the short trailer um, that they have the power and that they will continue to quietly do this work. I should mention that the Fuller film is on Films for Action. It's about 22 minutes and it's completely open access because we're using it for education purposes. But also, so if you have it in your country, you still bring it. So when you go, you meet people from your country, you say, oh, you remember also, so they say, yes. You remember when we used to read back home? So why don't we do it back? So we developed a structure that was different, slightly different than the one that my mom and her friends used. And you taught me and when we have a group of 10 of women to $200, I get the $2,000. That makes me independent. I feel the power. So I have something. I feel a power. And so this ancient African... But also, so if you have it in your... And so this ancient African tradition, which has helped so many people here in Canada for more than 100 years, remains virtually unknown. Starting with the Underground Railroad, this was a cooperative as noted by the renowned African-American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois way back when. And when people escaped slavery using the Underground Railroad, they would develop these systems called true bands. And true bands is a Roska system to set, that, was set, that would assist people to set up life in Canada. It is no longer reasonable for us to pretend that Roscas don't exist or to say we don't see what these women, the banker ladies are doing. What these women are doing is using their after taxed incomes to pool and gift each other funds that they may need to, to start a new business or to pay for tuition fees for their children or to buy a used car for their new employment. They have decided to cooperate with each other to meet livelihood needs. What we know is that Canada, like many other countries, have a shared history of valuing the informal. American political scientist Eleanor Ostrom and her colleagues won the Nobel Prize for economics for finding that cooperation and commoning is very much key to sustainable development. 
and that all people are not rational economic actors out for themselves. Canada actually has a rich legacy of cooperatives. As Canadians, we spend a lot of time and money in global development, which is why we should remember Ostrom's work on commoning. Those vested in community economic development can benefit by knowing about their own cooperative history before we go overseas to, do, to assist other countries. And it is one, it is a story that we have in Canada that started off in the informal. In the early 1900s in La Vie, Quebec, the Caisse Populaire were created in a moment of crisis by French Catholic minority who felt excluded by Protestant Anglophones. This is what is known around the globe as the Desjardins movement. Desjardins started off informally. Today, Quebec's Economie Sociale is revered as a model for all to learn about. We must remember that Black, Indigenous, and racialized Canadians have their own social economies too, and they have made major contributions outside of the formal Economie Sociale. As an undergraduate student at St. Mary's University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, I learned about the anti-Ganish movement. It also started off informally. Fisher folk gathered around kitchen tables to imagine a world of cooperativism to counter the spread of commercialized fishing. Today, the University of St. FX is an important site for learning about cooperatives and international visitors come yearly to hear about that legacy. People of the South have, been, have a long history of cooperation too, and this should be included in any narrative that we tell about cooperativism. Nowhere in the social economy education do we share what we know about black cooperativism. We don't teach the world about the banker ladies and the contributions of the Global South people in building cooperatives and contributing to a cooperative identity. Now that COVID-19 has revived the, and I put this in quotes, rebirth of mutual aid, we see the value of informally cooperating. Stories of neighbors helping each other are some of the most cherished ones we will tell about the lockdown. It is time to acknowledge the varied forms of cooperativism, and I'll list them. Mutual aid, collectives, self-help groups, and Roscas and to recognize that these informal collective institutions are important to building up civic life. None of these forms of economic cooperation are new to African descended people, because the truth is that politicized financial cooperation has been a way of life for people who are coping in racially tiered classed societies. The global pandemic has brought new awareness and we now understand why black people, especially women, would seek refuge in the solidarity economy and set up their own separate money pooling system. Because of systemic exclusion, Roscas are a social innovation fighting that kind of business exclu exclusion. We don't have to speak in the abstract anymore about the ways to carry out development. We have these banker ladies who are addressing underbanking and making sure that we have cohesion in our society. They are repairing the harms of anti-Black racism and other forms of alienation. Many of the women I interviewed are engaged in small catering businesses. Others are school bus drivers, cleaners, retail clerks, and grocery store employees. During this pandemic, we call these women essential workers but we don't pay them properly for the hazardous work they do. We refuse to even see the community work they do. We don't hire them for their community economic development expertise. Instead, they are stigmatized, as you can recall. They are labeled as terrorists, money launderers, and mules. But the Roscas they organize teach all of us that cooperation matters. And the banker ladies teach us not to rely solely on charitable models, but to value localized economic solidarity systems that can really bring change and transformation. Formal voluntary nonprofits here and around the world have had a colonizing history on people. Even our well-intentioned nonprofits here in Canada 
are mainly white and led by people completely detached from the lived experience of the very people they claim to help. The banker ladies I meet are often amused that a BA educated expert comes into the community to teach them about cooperation. I heard variations of this quote that I will tell you. It sort of explains their frustration and I quote, instead of using fancy scripts and words and wearing impressive suits, they should have the know-how to organize money groups like we do, end of quote. We need to invest in the black women cooperators who understand the concepts of trust and reciprocity, which are fundamental to rebuilding equitable economies. Roscas are a place for women to have the space to freely engage and talk about issues. Roscas give women the capital they need to lead their own self-determination and to participate in formal politics. I just find this very, very exciting. One woman in Rexdale in West Toronto, end of Toronto, confided to me that her provincial campaign was funded by Ayutu, a Somali Raska. Another woman in Brampton recently sent me a WhatsApp message to let me know that she has drawn on a partner bank, a Jamaican partner bank, to be able to represent her community in the next set of general elections. She is using partner to bring a voice to the political process for black Canadian women. This is really, really exciting. Um, as a political scientist, it's just amazing to see how these informal cooperative groups um, where, where money is being collected to assist in the electoral bid of black women. What I hope to impress on all of you here today is that Roscas are rooted in business foremost, but they're also but they're also rooted in friendship and mutual aid. And that these things are not mutually exclusive. The women I met with organized Roscas with their cooperative values embedded in the communities that they come from. And this is an important lesson for anyone who wants to do work in the development arena. Roscas are a legitimate informal institution in their own right and they share the same path as the traditional formal co-ops that we know about here in Canada and many other countries. Many political elites, policymakers, business elites are grappling with their own complicity in anti-black racism. But the banker ladies can correct these bias systems and they show us how to dismantle them through the work they do. I'm calling on all of you who know the value of cooperation to find ways to directly fund the banker ladies. As you can see from the words here, um, Fardosa, Somali-born Canadian, she's telling you that Hagbad is their bank and that she's taking credit for this local innovation. That many immigrant women like Fardosa, who have to deal with day on, day, day in, day out indignities, will still find the time to make Roska succeed is something that we should be grateful for. Hagbad is a cultural innovation and contribution to Canada and the world. And despite the risks that black immigrants endure like Fardosa, the banker ladies will build back better with a new financial system that is considerate of those who are being routinely excluded. I say to all of you in policy making who might be listening online, those who run CED known as Community Economic Development Organization to hire banker ladies as community development experts because they know how to do this work. No well-meaning outside expert with zero lived experience can actually do this work. How can we say we know about financial inclusion in our world and we give out these master classes to the global south about development when we ignore marginalized women in our own country who have been organizing development through Roscas for more than a hundred years. Roscas prioritize the voices of their members. Members' deliberation is key to making people feel valued in the society. I call on, on activists, the students that I see here and who are listening in, and the cooperators and policy makers to push for the funding and set up of a Roska network. This should be a network 
that is a global one, one that is committed to promoting mutual aid and cooperativism run by the banker ladies, black and immigrant women who actually know how these systems work and have firsthand experience using them. And most of all, they depend on them. This Roskin network focused on black women's lived experience will benefit all Canadian women. The good news is we don't have to start from scratch. There are proven models that can be useful for Canada's understanding of economic development and financial inclusion. The first is in the state of Kerala, India. The second, Ghana. The third, South Africa. All three are countries in the global south who recognize Roscoe's self-help groups and mutual aid as valuable to society and business. In India, the state has acknowledged CHIT funds and has had laws on the books. CHIT is a Roscoe and has had laws on the books since the 1800s. But it is the Kerala model in South India that Western aid giving countries should take note of. First, know that the state of Kerala is one of the world's most impressive places when it comes to gender equality, self-help groups and cooperatives. Leaders in Kerala have listened to marginalized women and in 1998, the Kundambashri movement was launched. And I'd like to add that feminists were at the forefront of that of that charge. In this program, in this program called the K Mission, Sanghas, or what they're what we know as the women's cooperatives, hidden away informally, were organized and brought into economic development plans. Kerala did the unthinkable by making women's collectives part of a regional development plan. It seemed unlikely to succeed because of the hidden nature of these groups. But the state was determined and put the resources in to build inclusively. It has been replicated where there has been trouble with equity. We can do Kundam Vashri here in Canada and elsewhere. My collaborators, including Dr. Christabel PJ at the University of Kerala and I are working on the Kundam Vashri model and how it can benefit black and diaspora Canadians. The second model, as I said before, is Ghana. The Ghanaian people for centuries have been experts on Susu. Premier economists from the country have worked with its central bank to ensure that a segment of the Susu system is included in retail banking sector. They've used a very pragmatic approach. They're not interested in formalizing all of their Susu system. With my colleague in Ghana, Professor Sami Kwaku Bonsu at the University of Ghana, we recently examined formal, for the formal aspects of the SUSU system. While in country, the Ghanaian SUSU Collectors and Cooperative Association, which is a national network, was so impressive that I invited them a couple of years ago to come and speak to the Banker Ladies of Canada. The important aspect of making this work will be for the state to make sure there are investments going into the building of financial systems that exist already. There is no need to collude with formal financial systems that have been problematic to black, indigenous and racialized people all over this country. This kind of commitment will actually build the trust between women of Canada and its government. In the third model that I wanna leave with you today is the National Association of Stockwells in South Africa. This has been in existence since the 1980s, and it's about educating the public about informal systems and to teach people that these are not illegal systems. These are not uh, predatory uh, systems. Rather, the, the association is engaged in capacity building, educating the public through knowledge sharing and networking, but most of all, validating the financial expertise of local women. These three models are validating Roscas and informal co-op systems. We have a lot to learn from Kerala, Ghana, and South Africa. The Global South can bring actually development this way. Um, and, and they have an expertise that we can use and draw on for our own economic development. We can amplify the work of the banker ladies as we create a Rosca network. We need to fund the banker ladies for their own social development, as well as for them to help advise us on how we do global development finance. So if folks from FinDev, IDRC and Global Affairs are listening, I think this is an opportune time to get that work done. To conclude, 
for the future of cooperation, Black feminist cooperators have much to show the world in terms of linking inclusive business to lived experience and how to organize collectively to push against racial capitalism and other forms of business exclusion. It's long overdue to make local knowledges central to understanding the field of international development. Making space inside of co the cooperative sector for Roscas is also important. That means that we have a wake up call for the cooperative sector to count self-help groups, collectives, mutual aid groups, and these Roscas that many black and racialized people organize and not to make the wrong assumption that they don't have any knowledge about cooperative systems. And at, in fact, this move to include Roscas will only grow the cooperative business sector so that it can actually be a viable alternative to the commercial model we got. To create a Rosca network means that we need to learn from the global south, from the Kerala's Kundabashri movement, Ghana's Susu system, and the National Stock Bell Association in South Africa. In doing this, work and will actually grow the cooperative model and it, it will help us in how we restructure and redesign economic development in our own country as well as abroad because it's been largely androcentric and european so the two main takeaways i have for you and the group that you see here is called sisterhood it's a sierra leonean canadian rosca group um, sent to me sometime um i think pre-pandemic so that's why no one's wearing that um, the two takeaways from today's lecture. We have black women known as the banker ladies who practice cooperative economics and who will continue to grow cooperativism in the world. We need to see them and to remunerate them for this service. Two, there is no shortage of theorizing by black feminist scholars in the field of political economy. And this should be acknowledged, read and cited. To close, the future of cooperation, for the future of cooperation to take hold, we need to rethink our cooperative traditions to include Roscas and higher banker ladies who have the firsthand knowledge of how these systems work and that who can draw on a centuries old expertise in tackling business exclusion through informal co-op. What is needed in this world more than ever are the banker ladies and their vision of cooperation and to figure out the ways to acknowledge black feminist thought in the field of international development. For the students listening in and here in front of me today, I invite you to find me at the University of Toronto. And I hope that together we can build knowledge about various forms of cooperative systems. Stay true, blessings to everyone, and I thank you for your time. Dr. Hossein, thank you so much for sharing your research and giving us, I think, uh, a much needed uh, point of, of positivism or positivity to look at the world of, of cooperatives and banker ladies and, and possible alternative visions of what, what development might look like. We have about 30 minutes uh, for question and answer. I've got a microphone and I've, I can, uh, make my way around the room as, as quickly as I can. And I'm really uh, uh, eager to, to hear questions from the floor and uh, we're, we can uh, take, okay. Our first speaker is Ian Spears. Uh, Dr. Sain, that was a very interesting talk. Thank you so much for coming to Guelph and can't see anything because my glasses are fogging up. Um, but it seems to me there's this tension between sort of the formality and informality. And it's the, it seems that part of the success is in the informality. Is that correct? Uh, well, maybe I'll just finish the question is to say that if you, if this gets scaled up, is there ever a risk that you lose what is, what is the essence of uh, of the Rosca system, that it, it is, that its nimbleness, that its 
genuine concern for each other's well-being um, is contingent on that informality and that that it's that it could be a victim of its own success. Is that something that's ever happened? Do you have anything to say about that tension? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, this whole playoff between or between informal and formal institutions. Um, so a, a few things I, I'll say um, that I think it really opens up um, for more discussion and debate. Um, but thank you for asking that question, Professor Spears. Informality in the Rosca system is something that can never be done away with. Um, and I think that that's why in the Ghanaian context, they took a very pragmatic approach to understanding how to incorporate Roscas into their economy. They recognize that there's gonna be a substantial subsect of Roscas that will always remain in the informal sector. And that perhaps there are other consumers who would like to see um, aspects of it um, um, more formalized for legal reasons and for consumer protection so that there is more choice. So if we take the Ghanaian example, you know, you have commercial banks, you have credit unions and cooperative banks that are formal. You have microfinance banks because NGOs do a lot of that. You have non-bank microfinance institutions in that country. But they have also included a place for Rosca institutions that are formalized SUSU collectors. But they know that that's just a drop in the bucket of the ones that are actually formalized. Millions more are un are in the informal sector, but that's okay because at least there's now a place of recognition. The issue, the divergence or the complication in the Canadian is that we keep these groups in the informal and then when it's time to seize funds that are happening, these banker ladies become very vulnerable for doing a very long tradition in Canada, which is mutual aid. Um, so there is some aspect of recognizing or at least understanding. And actually, to be quite honest, the COVID-19 pandemic has made the work I do quite easy because we now understand the value of cooperating informally, right? This idea of mutual aid is so on top of everyone's minds. You know, actual formal charities lost a lot of money during the pandemic because people were now donating to more sort of neighborhood types of associations in the informal way. So I think that now it's sort of to remove the stigma that things that are operating in the informal are somehow dodgy or illicit, particularly when black folk are doing them. It seems as though um, that's how we um, label them. So I think that there's some opportunities for us to rethink what is formal and informal because right now the situation isn't good in the Canadian context for people to continually hide away and not even to be recognized for what they're doing. There will always be a need for Roscas because how they grow is out of crisis actually. Um, I think that we can't think about formalizing or creating regulation for Roscas completely but we need to start thinking about how do we at least recognize that these are not illicit activities uh, that that people are doing and that it's a it's an ancient African tradition and actually it's celebrated around the globe. So many people are doing it. We just have to look for those models. But thank you for that question on sort of the play between informality and formality. It's a really important one. Other questions in the room? If not, I'll ask one of my own, but uh, I'd, I'd much prefer to hear from you. OK, here's one here. And and if I could ask you to just say your name before uh, asking your question. Hi, I'm Jeremy Weens, one of the graduate students. I'm in philosophy and development studies. Um, I'm just curious, are these Raskas, do they tend towards uh, a for-profit model or not-for-profit model? Uh, and does this have any advantages or disadvantages as compared with, say, more orthodox or that is to say Western forms of finance, which tend to be more profit seeking? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, um, I'd like to thank you for that question. Um, this idea, like, how do you define Roskas? Um, are they profit 
are they motivated by profit or is it the nonprofit, non-lucrative sort of objective? And Roskas will tell you quite plainly, Roska women will tell you that the Roska system is, is created to create financial access to people. It is to be able to recover their costs. Every group will decide what that looks like, but I would not say that they're motivated by um, making profit. Um, it's actually recovering costs that they spend to do and to administer these programs. But again, every group dynamic is different. Um, I think that I'd be reluctant to say that they are in the camp of nonprofit. It's more of something called the solid. I'd urge you to look up solidarity economies or um, this whole field of community economies um, because these are more grassroots people sort of led institutions. They're not professionalized by any means. So they're looking to collaborate and pool resources together. Um, in fact, I think what Roskas do is question why we are so dependent on subsidized charitable models because there is a degree of control that can come into play for certain groups of people that those systems are limited in how they can assist some of the most excluded people. So what they're doing here is actually teaching people, you know, we can do things differently. And I, I'd like to point you, if that's okay, to think about um, when you think about even this global phenomenon of microfinance by the Nobel Prize winner, Muhammad Yunus. He, came, he really learned um, a lot, you know, growing up in that cultural context about something called chitty, chitties or kitties or their local Roska systems by women there. And that kind of stimulated this idea of group banking um, that has become a global phenomenon. And there's lots of nonprofits that use these village and savings programs, embed them in their program development through subsidies, but they're actually kind of borrowing on. And then they're surprised, well, these systems seem to work. Well, of course they work. People have been doing them for a very long time. So I think that what the Roskas are trying to show people is that we have solidarity, solidarity systems. We have know-how about how to do development work. Why are you coming in with outside resources trying to teach us when you could be investing in building up these local systems that we already have. But thanks for that question. Now we are spoiled for choice. Hi, thanks, Dr. Hussein. My name is Joanne Moores. I'm a PhD student here uh, in political science at the University of Guelph. And um, my question is about the cooperative and credit union uh, sector here in Canada, which is quite sort of large and, and formal. And so I'm wondering if, uh, if you could share with us um, what types of synergies or, um, you know, education or um, linkages there could be and, and how you'd like to see that um, moving forward. That is a very good troublemaking question that I'm glad a political scientist asked. <laughs> um, we, you're right, Joanne is right. There are lots of cooperatives and credit unions spread across this country. We know about them and they are actually a very important vehicle to giving us an option that's different from commercial types of firms, right? Focused on the shareholder profit model. So you have cooperative credit unions that are really organized by a set of principles mandated by the International Cooperative Alliance that really is focused on community, on sharing of surplus resources, but most importantly, one member, one vote idea. Unfortunately, this is the problem we have in, the, in this country, is that currently our formal cooperative system, both in the academy, but also in practice, are not looking at ver uh, what I call varieties cooperativism. We're not thinking about different types of groups that may be informal and not formally registered as counting as part of the cooperative umbrella. 
So what happens is that a lot of formal cooperators make the wrong assumption that people don't know about what a cooperative business is like. Well, if you go to Canadians and you use that kind of way of speaking to them, then they don't know your brand of cooperativism. But if you go to them and say, hey, what is a chip? What is a susu? What is a patna? What is an arisan? Many people will start to understand, oh, I have these kinds of cooperatives. Of course I'm familiar with them. And they can contribute. So there's a missed opportunity, Joanne, in terms of broadening what the cooperative sector can do. There is a scholar by the name of Richard Williams, if you want to reference, who has been talking about cooperativism from the South. So globalization from below and how, how, what opportunity exists for cooperatives. And he actually does say that, you know, what we need to understand in the West is this idea of cooperativism doesn't start from the industrial revolution. It depends on the timeline that you're thinking about. So if you, and the type of cooperative you want. So if you're thinking about more informalized types of cooperatives like Sewa in India, that has like 30 million members who are cooperating, then that's a pretty impressive cooperative group, right? And it's a way for us, if co the formal cooperative and credit union sector could try and figure out how to follow their own set of principles, which is to educate and assist other cooperators, then Roskas would fall into that. But for now, people are not including them in the group. They even question whether they're a cooperative. Um, but a lot of the values, and hopefully my book will be useful on the banker ladies and their contribution to the solidarity and cooperative sector, will help as some sort of guideline to instruct cooperatives, not just here in Canada, but elsewhere, about our own informal traditions of starting out sort of outside of the formal lens and try to assist those kinds of cooperatives because that's a great way for the cooperative sector to grow, right? And so that we're not just stuck with this, this one kind of business model that is quite individualized, but now you have formal co-ops, but then you have these informal ones. And actual Canadian, in the groups that I met with, primarily Black Canadian women, it's not uncommon to find other Canadians participating. Because you have to remember these Roskas, these women work in hospitals as orderlies. They're working with a variety of Canadians. They're working with, you know, Chinese, they're working with white Canadians, Italians, Polish. And people are like, hey, what are you doing? I need a savings system. I could use with a lump sum of money. So then these systems actually become useful to society. They're like, oh, that's a mutual aid. I kind of know about that from Nova Scotia. And people find similarity. So I think that there is, that's a good question. I wish someone would take that up as a project and do that study of how to bring together the formal cooperative sector with these kinds of Roska and self-help or mutual aid systems. Thank you for the question. It's a good one. It's a contentious one, but it's a good one. <laughs> Hi, my name is Roberta Hawkins. I'm a faculty member in geography. Uh -huh. Thank you for such an interesting and important talk. It was really uh, refreshing uh, to be here in person and to hear such interesting insight. Um, part of my question was actually just answered, but I was hoping you could speak a little bit more about the groups in Toronto and, and surrounding area that you engaged with. Specifically, I'm wondering about similarities and differences between maybe um, where people are coming from or their particular Roska traditions. Yeah. I was interested in the beginning when you kind of alluded to mostly it's consensus, but sometimes it's not consensus. And so I'm just so curious to hear more about like what's going on within the groups. And it's, it's fascinating to hear that there are other Canadians joining groups from other countries and diaspora. And yeah. so Anything you can tell us about that, I'd be really interested to hear. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for coming. I should be saying that to everyone. Um, we're so now used to this sort of Zoom world and show up in your PJs and what have you. So I thank you um, for coming out. It's really has touched me and it, it, it's very special that you came out. Um, yeah, the Roska groups in the Canadian, I'm going to speak because she asked for the Canadian um, cases of Roskas 
are quite distinctive from the other places I used because when I had to spend a lot of time in the book that I'm revising on what Black Canadian actually means because it's so so diverse, right? I'm speaking about and I'm doing it in Montreal and Toronto where they both have very different dynamics. So hey, it, um, in Montreal, there's a very strong Haitian influence, um, but also Scotians. So people who are two, three, four, maybe even five generations, black Canadians that came by way of sort of the US. Um, you have gener like two or second or third generation um, black Canadians from immigrant parents. Um, the, there are there are women who self-identify as black and that could be from a number of countries in Africa as well as the Caribbean. So I literally would have focus groups where I'd have Somalis, Jamaicans, Sierra Leoneans, Ghanaians, Nigerians, uh, Grenadians, uh, Vincentians, Afro-Mexicans, Brazilians, all in one focus group, right? So you can imagine that it's kind of chaotic. <laughs> People have very different and very strong views on this system. And I have to say, if you're a researcher, I love I would love more students to do this research. It's one of the only things I almost felt like I had to convince or, you know, cajole people to come out for microfinance. For Roska group groups, a hall will show up like it will be packed out, packed to the room because these women for the first time in their lives, Someone is asking them to come in and be an expert on something that they know better. So often I always say my sessions are hijacked by the banker ladies um, and that's OK because I can sit back and they call me the scribe. So I actually write things away. But to answer your question, it's what when I first started off doing Roska's um, back in, I think I started looking at it around at the same time I was finishing up my dissertation in 2010 and 11. In, in the Toronto context. And what I found was that initially the groups were organized by cultural silos. So Jamaicans, Bayesians, uh, Nigerians, Somalis or Sudanese, right? All organized sort of by silos. Kind of makes sense because sometimes it's language. It could be location. You know, it's a social event too. Because if you've ever been to a Somali Ayoto meeting, you're having fish samosas, <laughs> you're having hot spicy tea. It's really a camaraderie event. And it's like hours these women spend talking about their men folk who do them wrong. Uh, what kind of politics is pissing them off that day? Who has any kind of job notices that could be useful? But also then they don't leave this kind of Tupperware party before they deal with their finances and to hear what people are doing with their monies, right? And so initially there were cultural silos. But then I started realizing when I as I expanded it over the years that because people started identifying based on community. So where they live, not by cultural community. So I would hear from a Somali who would say I'm joining. I joined the Jamaican Patna because the Somali leader banker head banker lady doesn't know what she's doing. She's just organized. People are late with payments. She doesn't sanction them, but the Jamaican lady, no one messes with her. And I was like, wow. So there's all this intercultural group dynamic going on that was really excellent to see that people now were looking at the leadership skills of their banker lady. I'm not throwing away the idea that there is a cultural relevance for certain groups, but there is a lot more interaction in these groups who are familiar with them um, and then and also anyways, they decide on how they're going to set them up. If you know what I mean, like they convene meetings. Um, usually they do it by consensus. People kind of get to a point where they agree. So that takes a long time of discussing because you can imagine having, you know, 20 women in a room and deciding how things are going to happen. Um, it takes time, um, but when they have a problem. Someone is late with payment and they have to think about what to do. They may not have an agreement. So the executive that they elected will be like, OK, we're going to vote on this. And the majority, <laughs> there are two sort of motions that get made and they decide. And they tr usually what I understand from my time doing this work is that that's kind of like the last resort. Mostly people want to do things through consensus because then everyone has a shared 
understanding of where they're going, but the vote often will come into play <laughs> if it's complicated, and that could be by a show of hand, but if it's sensitive, then they'll do it through ballot and keep it more private. But a lot of this was in person, right? And I'm speaking about the in person, but there are Roska groups, younger groups who do it via email um, technology. So there's a group of people that I didn't show here today, but they like formality because if they're doing bank transfers and stuff, it sucks to have the bank freeze your money because they're seeing payments come in and out of it. So for them, having an understanding of how to do these systems is important. And actually, I, don't, I shouldn't take credit for doing the Banker Lady film. They actually told me that a film like this would be useful instead of just writing long essays behind a paywall that doesn't actually affect policy change. And I thought, oh, I'm the least creative person to do a film. But there are ways as academics that we can think through how we share and disseminate our research that can have impact. And a 22 minute documentary packs a lot in, but it at least starts the conversation and getting awareness out there. And I'm just trying to do that piece of work. I'm happy to speak to you more. It's a really good question. It takes a geographer <laughs> to ask this really insightful. Thank you very much. Hi, Erin Morgan. Um, I have a question for you about the future. So in the future, when we've figured out how to recognize informal cooperative systems and formal in the same Canadian economy, tell us about Kerala India and what's possible beyond sorting out the right now. Like what kind of innovation and amazing opportunities are there in the future. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a really good. You should probably, before you hand the mic back, Erin, can you tell them what organization you represent? That could help. I, I don't really want to steal your thunder. I, oh, you I'm don't? from the Ontario Cooperative Association, and I think you're amazing. <laughs> OK, <laughs> thank you. I think it's important to note that because we do have cooperators in the room who are feminists in their orientation, and they're interested in um, how to be more bold in the cooperative sector how to culturally diversify a sector that has been historically referred to as stale, pale, and male. And there are some really interesting women cooperators in Canada that are trying to shift things a bit. And um, there's one of them. So I'm really happy to have her here in the house. And that was a good question. Um, so the point of me bringing up other models like Kerala India, and I would say that you would have every justification from your board of directors to have you go on a study tour. And actually, cooperators in Canada should take this opportunity to visit or even bring in those experts from Kerala, feminists from Kerala who've been studying this topic for decades. So I wouldn't do any justice on this, but my next book on community economies is done by a feminist economist out of Kerala who worked for years on my end, both seconded to the Kundambashri system, who could probably do a better job at explaining it, but I will tell you what I know and what I am learning is that Kerala, like many states in India, have had to deal with inequities that are different from the kinds that we know of. Um, in that part of the world, there are issues, of course, with them, with gender bias, but there are also caste issues, very complicated, extremely controversial issues of caste. Um, there are issues with scheduled tribes not being fed into the development process. Um, we're familiar with class but just imagining that other layer of caste bias and exclusion. I should mention that India also has its own African descended people living in parts of um, South India as well. And so what Kerala did, because they were always sort of ahead of many places, and you can look at the literature, I'm happy to share with you, in terms of how to do gender equality. So it's one of these states in India that's quite distinct 
um, for having very high rates of literacy and very low infant uh, mortality rates and what have you. And actually at the start of the pandemic, Times of India, you know, celebrated their um, their chief minister, uh, minister of health, I believe, for her really magnificent effort in keeping the COVID numbers very low at the start of the pandemic when India was just unfolding, right? So you can see that in Kerala, India, there's been a real emphasis on women. And back in 1990, Amartya Sen wrote a book called Development as Freedom. And in that book, he compared the human development between people of Kerala, India to the African-American life. And when, in terms of freedom of opportunity and development and what have you, and the people of Kerala won. And I mean, he measured it, of course, I'm saying it in a very paraphrasing it, but basically they were much more advanced and had um, a longer life expectancy, um, had more possibilities for opportunities and, you know, these kinds of things that matter in, in when we think about poverty beyond just income. And African Americans lost, particularly black males in that country, in one of the world's richest countries. And so that was an important redefining moment to think about how Kerala, this small little state in India that is quite <laughs> distinct, but there was a conscientious effort by feminists, by development people to think about inclusive development. And part of that act was also going into these really unknown, hidden away places and to figure out where these sanghas were. These collectives, like our Rasca women, figuring out where they are and then making sure they become a part of the development arena. They knew community development was happening, but, but cooperatives couldn't do that work by themselves. It actually took the state to start to say, hey, these things exist. We're gonna put the resources in. We're gonna rethink what development looks like and how to get this voice into the planning so that it could actually be sustainable. Otherwise, aid money can actually just really replicate the entrenched inequalities that already exist in the society. And what they were trying to do was to break that. And there is some, I have a really good paper I'd love to share with you, but it's in the Canadian Journal of International Development by Bina Agarwal. And she does a comparative study um, with Kerala and another state, but not, I'm missing what state it is. <laughs> but in any event, it's a really clear um, definition of how it really took government with the academy, really a joint effort with cooperativists to really think through how are we going to do this work together? Like that's the way, and it's a real revamping of what we know development to be. So it's not this expert driven, but actually ground up. Sewa model is also a really good, important case to look at. And the cooperative sector often does celebrate that, the international global cooperative sector. I think our trouble is here in Canada is that we still can't get over what Professor Spears was talking about is this informality of it. Like, well, how do we do that? I think we have the, the resources, the capacity to start thinking through that. How do we incorporate these people? Um, because they're already invested in, in, in civic society building. How do we make them a part of it? Um, but yeah, and that's work I'd like to take up with the Ontario Cooperative Association any day. Well, on that note, it, it's it's so tempting to keep the conversation going and we probably could for hours and hours, but I'm conscious of the time and thankful uh, to you, Dr. Hossein, for, for providing just such an inspirational and and educational talk, I think, on, on both the potential and the reality of Roscoe's and the cooperative movement. Uh, just a small token, it's it's not a loan or a <laughs> rotating credit, but <laughs> thank, thank you, you very, very much. much again. Thank you very wonderful much. Wonderful to have you here. Thank you. And, and for those of you who are interested in, in taking the conversation further, we're actually hosting a round table tomorrow morning at 10.30, featuring Aaron, featuring Dorothy Nyambe from, from MEDA, and another uh, number of guests uh, discussing this very question. And so if you're interested, just email us at IDS and we can uh, we can put you in touch. But thank you once again for a wonderful experience, wonderful night. Thank you.